Hi, I'm James McGuire, and today we're talking about robotic process automation, a key enterprise technology that adds artificial intelligence to business workflows. To discuss that, I'm joined by someone who knows a lot about the topic. With me is Eric Tyree, Head of Research in Artificial Intelligence at Blue Prism. Eric, very good to have you with us today. Thank you very much. Pleasure to be here. And, and you are in England today, correct? That's right. That's right. Um, came over here you know, about 25 years ago for, for mm -hmm. nine months. Mm -hmm. Been here ever since. <laughs> Great. Okay. Well, I think what's interesting is that, you know, you're sitting in England. I'm in the San Francisco Bay Area. We are thousands of miles away from each other. Mm -hmm. and yet we're talking in real time over these video screens. We're talking to our computers and where we're chatting in real time. And we're talking about artificial intelligence. Yep. It strikes me as a, a very 2021 thing to be doing. It is. And and and, it's, and also, I've never shown my ages here, but um, I remember <laughs> when, you know, talk of video phones was seen as very futuristic. And now very. it's like, it's almost seen as like the bane of modern life. So it's, like, <laughs> <laughs> it's true. I mean, we used to, we used to like yearn for it. And now that we have it, it's like, oh, good. Could we turn no. it off? Yeah. yeah. Right. Yeah. So, the, the, the RPA market, I mean, I, I think I hear mixed reports of, of, about the RPA market in that a lot of companies are very interested in it, and there is certainly yep. is adoption, and, and the revenue figures are, are going to the roof. I mean, it's really rapidly Ooh. growing. But my, my question is, is it fully mainstream yet, or is it more, uh, you know, cutting edge? What, what, what is your sense about robotic process automation and, and companies actually deploying it? Yeah, it's definitely past the early adopter phase. Mm-hmm. I wouldn't describe it as mainstream yet, but I think it's reached the point where most companies are aware of it to some degree. I mean, I have I was first seeing it good five, six, seven years ago, um, mm. actively trying to use it in my previous company, so about a year ago. Mm. So I think it's it's well known. And those people are aware of it. They know it's a technology that's out there, but I don't think it's seen as a mainstream standard toolkit as part of the overall digitalization you know, mm -hmm. of, of piece. Mm -hmm. So it's still, I think it's beyond early adopter, but it's definitely still emerging is the way I would describe it. Gotcha. I, I think that, that I hear too, in terms of the adoption and maybe something that is still slowing it down is that not everyone is absolutely thrilled with their RPA deployment. I mean, they, they want the potential and then they buy it or they, they, you know, they rent it as a service. And mm. sometimes they run into problems and they, it, it, it turns into an expensive science experiment. It might not work for them. I mean, mm -hmm. it does work. Of course, it's, it's, it's a real help, but it doesn't always work. I guess, what, what, what are some of the, the challenges and some of the snafus that you've run into? Sure. into yeah, I, you know, the number one, now? yeah. And, and, and I think the, the, the number one problem is it's too, too low down on the company. So it's, mm. it's, 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 it's used by a small group of people in a small business unit. They mm -hmm. don't have the support they need. It's not right. um, sanctioned. You know, by by senior management, right. they don't have the budget and the supports they need. I mean, we're finding it's it, what's true of of automation is is, is what's true of digitization is that mm. <clears throat> the key to success is that you're you're doing two things. One that you it's 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 goal directed. It, it's right. very clear what the business case is for, right. and what you're trying to achieve, and it's measurable. But also that um, uh, you know you're 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 looking at whatever you're trying to automate, just like with digitization. You, you, you can't just take what you've currently got and automate it because all you're doing is taking your existing spaghetti bowl and automating the spaghetti again, which right. isn't really you're giving you much value. The, the, whereas successful people do are a bit more thoughtful. The, um, they really mm -hmm. step back and think, okay, if I'm going to take my mortgage desk and I'm going to apply automation to it, what I really should be doing is not looking at my processes, copying them and just mm -hmm. taking the manual work and replacing it with, 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 with a digital worker. What you should be doing is saying, okay, if I'm going to redesign mortgage processing from an automation first perspective or digitization first perspective, mm -hmm. you, you, you start with the blank slate and you redesign right. the entire thing and you think, okay, where has automation got its, its, its appropriate place? Where does human uh -huh. work have its appropriate place? And effectively what you're doing is you're rearranging the way in which work gets done. That's getting the best out of robotics and the best out of, out of people. Hmm. Um, and that's when you get you start seeing success. And also, if you're gonna, you know, if you're a bank and you're redoing your whole mortgage desk, that's a big decision. You know, that's something that senior right. management have had thought about, sanctioned. It's probably part of a bigger company strategy. Right. And that's when you get success success in this. So interesting. It, it's not really improving an existing process. It, it tends to actually revolutionize the existing process exactly. if, if it's going to really work. Okay, that's a pretty big exactly. deal. So people aren't doing as a, a little shadow IT project with a company credit card and thinking we're going to experiment with this. It has to really be 
a lot of buy-in from above to make it work. It, it does, but also you, you're kind of touching on something that's also part of the revolution is that it, it's, it's, this is about automation driven by operations. So the, mm. the, the, the reason RPA has been so successful and has such a high uh, ROI <laughs> is you're automating on top of existing IT. So for example, if you're looking at digitizing your mortgage desk, Right. There's two ways to really do it. I mean, the, the one way is you go, you rebuild it from scratch physically and you build a straight through processing system. Mm -hmm. um, and that's perfectly doable. And it's actually in, in some ways uh, um, uh, the, the standard way of doing things. The problem with it is that the investment it takes is huge and it takes mm. a huge amount of time and it's a high mm -hmm. risk project. So mm. the appeal of RPA in this case is, well, let's say I'm a smaller bank and I do want to digitize my customer journey and I do want to digitize my mortgage desk because the market says I must have a 10 minute mortgage. I've got to right. prove mortgage in 10 minutes. Right now it's taking me two weeks. That's right. not going to work anymore. So if I'm a smaller bank with, 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 with less resources or even a large bank and I've got other capital demands, mm -hmm. why not focus you know, on rebuilding the customer shop front then use RPA to create the automation in the back. So that way you're getting the straight through processing through RPA using existing systems Okay. And you're investing your capital on, on the customer experience. So you're getting both. You're delivering to the customer what they really want in terms of the, the shopping experience. And you're also delivering that speed of approval that uh, the customer actually wants. But that's the hard bit to do in the back. Because if you try and build straight through processing across your legacy systems, you're going to spend some money and you're going you're to take some time. Um, right. so, so in theory, what you can do in this case is you can go through and, and create the straight through processing without IT. You know, this is this is RPA sits on top of, of, of existing systems and interacts right. them like a human would. Right. So strictly speaking, you don't need IT's involvement. And that's another indicator of success is when IT involvement is minimized. You know, this is something mm. that, that must be, you know, ideally uh, operations run. And I think, of, you know, where people don't think that through right and they get either too much IT mm. or not enough. So they're not thinking mm. enough about, okay, if I'm going to automate on top of these systems, I need the communications with IT so that they upgrade a system. Right. My automation team knows about it before they do it, so we can make sure that the systems are still going to run when they upgrade the system. So there's, right. it's getting that that um, coordination between IT and operations right, which is a much smaller role from IT traditionally, but it's still right. there and it needs to be coordinated and managed. Well, then you're suggesting actually that that for to, for RPA to succeed, then management and IT actually have to not just communicate, but it, but work together. That, that or so that might be one of the core challenges of RPA. Like uh, IT and management have to suddenly speak the same language or, or some kind of they a do, similar language. They do. And and the way to explain this to IT, because you want to build the trust. And the way I explain it to people is is look, you know, um, in a way we're kind of liberating you. And 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 if you know, as a CTO, I'm thinking about okay, where do I invest in new systems? Where do I try to extend life out of legacy systems? Mm -hmm. Um RPA means that I can get a lot more life out of, the, out of those legacy systems. What more is if I bring in a new system, I can get the ROI faster now because I can uh -huh. use automation to get more use out of the system a lot faster than I could have before. Right. So RPA works really, really well with, with, with uh, technology strategy. When you're talking about individual project, you know, if you, if you go to the IT department and say, okay, I need, I need a complete rewrite of our mortgage processing system. They're gonna take a deep breath, say, okay, you know, we'll get some requirements. We'll come back in six months with, right. with an estimate. Mm -hmm. And in about five years, we'll have your system. Whereas with RPA, <laughs> you could be up in months. And, and once IT realized, hey, this means I can focus on other things and I can get better, I can get continued life mm -hmm. on existing things, mm -hmm. they're on board, you know, typically. Yeah. They need to trust though that, that, that the technology is stable. They need to know that the RPA vendor is enterprise class and these things are quite important. And so one of the things, you know, we focus on is, you know, the CTO of a, of, a, of a regulated company in mind. You know, if I'm that CTO, what, is this, what does RPA have to have in it in terms of security, in terms of stability, robustness, mm -hmm. all that kind of things that the CTO worries about, they have to absolutely be in there. And that's part of the trick to get it to work is, is, is using um, you know, industrial strength tools uh, uh, to do it because otherwise you will, you will hit a wall with IT because they won't, they won't sign it off unless it's of sufficient you know, quality. Right. Well, I, you've, you've touched on this, certainly, but I, my, my question is, what are some best practices? If, if a company, you know, came to you and said, you know, Eric, we're going to embark on this RPA journey. Yeah. We're confused. It's going to be a long, dark journey. We're going to yeah. spend a lot of money. We're worried. I mean, what are a couple of guiding principles that we should bear in yeah. mind for, for RPA, yeah. best practices? Okay. Sure. Okay. So, so I think it depends what you want to achieve. So I'm assuming that you're looking for transformational, uh, 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 something transformational. I mean, obviously, if you want to go in and do something small, it's, it's a different sort of set of priorities. 
Right. Well, let's just say you, this is something big and you know, you want to start with your mortgage desk and you're going to move to other back office systems and, and, and you're doing a big, big, a big automation play. Mm -hmm. The first thing you need to do is make sure you understand what this means strategically. So why are you even doing this? You know, is, is this part of, um, you know, as a bank, are you doing this because the market demands five minute mortgages and you have to start providing it? And that's the, the, this is all about customer service, modernizing the shop front. Is this something or, or something else you see with um, knowledge industries is you'll see companies with, you know, what's called uh, systemic fee compression, which is a really nice way of saying people don't want to pay your exorbitant fees anymore. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and, I like uh, the phrase. <laughs> say, say, say the phrase one more time. <laughs> fee, 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 compression? fee compression. It sounds like um, lowering costs, but it's a fancier way of saying yeah, it. Yeah. It's a fancy way of saying we're charging too much and we got to, we got to reduce it. We got to reduce our fees. So you're seeing it in, in, in law now where, where even upmarket law firms are getting so much competition, they're actually lowering their fees. So, you know, your problem now is, you know, how do I, I have to, I have to redirect my human capital from non-revenue generating to, to more revenue generating work. So the way I'm going to keep going. So, um, so, so, Again, you're thinking top-down strategy. So what I'm going to do with automation in that case is I'm going to attack non revenue generating work so I can free up those people to spend more time, you know, doing, you know, working with clients and doing the value add they're paying us for. Mm -hmm. So again, it's it starts with that strategic alignment. Most important thing. Without that, it's going to sit there and fester as a small project and never get anywhere. The next piece is to set up your center of excellence. Um, it does take some skill and some knowledge. It's not great. It's the kind of thing that a power user can build. You know, you don't need to be, you don't need a PhD in robotics to do it. You need to be the kind of person who can, it's comfortable with macros. Well, if you've got that kind of- The coding, right? The actual software. Yeah. So is, you tell me, is, is it a low code thing or not? Low so code. It's, it's, it's not, is it low code? Yeah, it's low code, but there's okay. some, you know, we can train somebody in days on it. Um, okay. Because there's some right. basic kind of concepts you need to understand, mainly like how do you the, the light programming concepts. But if you're if you're if you already can write a macro, you can do it. It's ah. you'll, you'll learn it right okay. away. So it's a low code, not quite no code. We're we're trying to get as close to no code as we possibly can. Right. Um, I think you know I think the whole world's trying to get as close to no code as it possibly can. It's right. Going to be a bit asymptotic. I think everyone's going to get closer and closer and closer. We're never going to quite get there. Right. But um, but the the idea is point and click. I want to, you know, I want, I want the, the digital worker to interact with that system over here. It's, you know, I literally click on it. I get drop down menus. I click what I want it to do. So it's very, very simple to use in that sense. Um, but it is something, you know, you're, you're kind of person who's comfortable doing that. So it's, you know, it's, it's, right. it's or you're, you know, if you're, if you're comfortable programming, uh, you know, um, you know, your cable box and you can, you can do it. Oh, well, um, so which does a exclude a lot of people. Then. Be well, well, but, well, that's um, true. Not everyone can, not everyone can program their cable box. I, yeah, it, it could take a half afternoon to be sure. Yeah, exactly. So, um, um, so you need so you need that that kind of level of skill to be developing. But you also need people who know how to who can construct a some sort of operational structure to manage automation that can either be done centrally or some people federate it so they put groups in different divisions and maybe have one central group who kind of advise. But um, mm -hmm. But you need that center of excellence, and and you know they run the automation projects. They understand how automation projects work. Um, they, they have the skill sets, and they're not just to build the digital workers, but the stakeholder management. They know how to re-engineer processes and can do all that. So it's, hmm. um, you know, and that's quite important. And um, but I think if you have those two things, you know what you're trying to achieve from a strategic right. level. You've right. got the operational structures in place, and then at project by project level. You have a very clear understanding of what you're trying to achieve. So if it's the if it's you know the, the reorganization of the mortgage desk, you understand strategically why you're doing it, and you understand your target. I got I got to get this down to five minutes. So that means that most of the time I'm going straight through, um, and there might be a quick human check at some point, but but really it should be 100% electronic. And that, but I do know I'm going to get cases are going to get kicked out to humans. I know I'm not going to hit five minutes all the time. That's fine. You make sure that's agreed with the with the customer side. You've right. got a very well defined process for doing that, um, but the point being is that you you understand what you're doing strategically. You understand what your metrics are for that particular project, mm -hmm. um, and you've got the right kind of you've established the right operational structures to be able to to build automations and and these are things that you know for example I mean every vendor trains people on so it's not like you know you right. you you right. you're sort of handed a Lego set and you have to go <laughs> figure it out without an instruction right. manual. You know, for, right, like right. with Ross, you know, we'll train you. We have a thing called the ROM, which is basically your your best practices and 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 methodology for creating automations. And we train you on that, and we train you on how to create a, a center of excellence. 
because mm-hmm. um, we know it, that, that that's critical. And if you don't have that, you're not going to get the success. So it's in our right. interest to do this. Um, sure. I, the, the, all I argue is that the bigger your ambitions are, the more senior and the more aligned you need to be with with, with strategy. So it's, it's um, and that's just, I think that's true of any project. I, I, particularly if you're going to be playing around with the company's operations. You know, you want to know that you, you're, you're aligned and, and your boss and your boss's boss and your boss's boss's boss all know what you're doing and agree to it and think it's a great thing. Right. Um, and you should be all right. Um, yeah. Well, it's interesting because the, the technology is you know, being really rapidly deployed. It's maybe it's not, as, as we mentioned earlier, it's not all the way mainstream, but it's ahead of there rapidly. I, you mm. know, given that, I think it's interesting to look at where the future of RPA is maybe a, a few years out. And I think one of the key parts of that is the idea of artificial intelligence. And let me see if I can clarify my question. It might be a little vague, but you, you might help me clarify it. Is that when people talk about AI, sometimes there's a lot of confusion about it. I, I yep. think about artificial intelligence is, is a system that can learn without human intervention. Once you set it up, it can begin to learn and adapt. So I think a certain amount of things that are called AI aren't necessarily really AI. Yes. Uh, you know, so well, I, I guess it's more I, than what you're saying. So, all right, so I'll, 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 I'll put it to you this way. It's everything. Please. All right, I'll give you the cynical answer and I'll give you the a real answer. The cynical <laughs> okay. answer is the old, the old, the, you know, the old chestnut that any technology sufficiently advanced appears to be magic. Yes. And I think with AI, you know, anything, any technology that's sufficiently advanced appears intelligent. Um, it's mass right. at the end of the day. Um, but, um, but yeah, so, so, so the, the, there's several areas that we're very interested in that, that, that I would describe as AI. Number okay. one is what you just described, machine learning. So we, so we want digital workers to be able to, to learn from experience. So they got to be able to look at data, learn from that data and be able to make reasonably intelligent decisions. Okay, and and that's the classic kind of definition of, of AI. Um, but we also use another form of AI that's actually much older. In fact, the, it's the oldest form of AI out there, but it was, it was very esoteric until very recently. It's called program synthesis. And this is all about- um, Programs what? Get, I'm sorry, I didn't program hear the- Program synthesis. Aha, uh-huh, okay. All right. And this is about how do you get digital work or how do you get programs to write their own programming? And people have been trying to do this since the 1950s. So it's actually older mm-hmm. than machine learning. Right. Um, but it's always been kind of an academic subject, and it's with robotics that it suddenly exploded out into the into the mainstream. And mainly, where, where this has come from is um, if you want to scale up digital workforces quickly, hmm. it helps the digital workers can write their own programming. Right. And so that's something we've become you know we're, we're really really interested in. So we've currently got digital workers writing the design. So when you when you produce an automation, you first you know you rethink the the the, the process. You create a design, and then based on the design, you produce the actual automation. So what we're doing, what we just released, or released a second version of now, is is the automation of you can record the process, and the digital work can write the design for you. Oh, okay. The next release uh, uh, is going to be it writes the programming, or at least most of it. And the idea here is it's not perfect. The idea is it's taking the busy work out for the developer. So the idea is it's producing a basic design that you might want to tweak and optimize. The code it produces is 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 most of what you need, but again, you're going to have to tweak it a little bit to get it to work. Mm-hmm. But the plan, you know, already we've taken 25% of the time out of producing a, 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 an automation just by doing the design work, mm-hmm. and we're we're going to get it to about 60, 70% by the end of this year by 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 taking out the programming. And so again, you know, that's that's that underneath the hood. Yes, there's there's also a bit of machine vision and machine learning in there as well. So it's not just you know program synthesis. And that's maybe what the trend is, is that with, what I love about robotics, one of the reasons I got into it, is it brings all these things together. So you also have natural language processing and computer right. vision, machine learning and programs, all these things are all coming together in one place. And that, I haven't seen that. You know, that was very rare to, to encounter that until now, because you need it. A digital worker's got to do everything a person can do. So it needs to see, it needs to be able to listen, it needs to be able to speak, it needs to be able to learn, it needs to be able to, to to, to, to reprogram itself to, you know, well, it's almost physically. like the, the uh, you know, when you talk about the program synthesis and, and the, the programs are, are writing programs. So in, in, in essence, the robots are building robots. Is that yes. what you're saying? Okay. Yeah. So it's, it's kind of the, the first step in the entire robot revolution where maybe they'll eventually take us to take over the world. It's, but, well, I put it's the revolution eating itself. So the robots are sort of, you know, um, uh, but they're not, you know, to be clear, you right. know, um, right. modern AI is nowhere near where people think it is. Um, yes. you know, it's right. pretty basic yeah. stuff that robots are doing with AI um, chatbots mm-hmm. work in very narrow, you know, 
the really good chatbots do one thing. So you can get a chatbot to to take a fast food order, right? Pretty accurately. Yeah. Um, I was in travel where where previously where we're we're looking at chatbots for for booking travel. Hmm. That works if you're saying I'd like to book a flight to New York, please. Right. If you say to it, I'd like to book a flight to New York via Buenos Aires, but only if it's Tuesday, in which case I want to go Uruguay first. Right. <laughs> Forget it. <laughs> but see that even that could work. But I think the real problem is going to be, I want to, I want to book a flight to New York. You know, should I even go to New York? Which is a, maybe a question a real travel bat would never answer. But the the, the higher end decision making is going to be the most elusive. The the, yeah. the decision tree can always become more elaborate, but then. When you get above merely a decision tree to really decision making, that's where AI begins to peter out. True or false? Yeah, and I think I think um, you know, except in very narrow, well-defined places. So, for example, you can you can use artificial intelligence to diagnose um, MRI scans better mm -hmm. than a human. Oh, really? Okay. But that's because it's been trained on that one task, so it does one job really well. But that same okay. tool is going to be useless at you know any other photographic type type processing. So, hmm. so AI can work very, very well, but it's always in a very narrow, it's trained in a very narrow space. So they tend to, it's like, they're like deep specialists. And yeah, yeah. Um, but the reality is what it's doing is it's taking out, um, it's, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's, 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 it's like a force multiplier. You use it as a tool to, to help you do things. So, so go back to, to um, you know, the digital workers writing their own programming. Right. We're not putting any, digital worker developers out of work. We're just making it more productive. Because now what it is, they can build a digital worker in a week yeah. rather than 16 weeks or whatever. So so they're going to just build more. You know I mean? it's, not, it's not like they do just one digital worker then suddenly have no work for 15 weeks. They just do 15 digital workers now instead of, instead of one. Right, right. And that's, well, yeah, that's what AI is doing at the end of the day. I mean, it's it's a real issue. I know that we we, we chatted briefly about the, the New York Times article and that there, there's some Ooh. coverage of Will RPA put staffers out of business? And it is, after all, performing some of the more mundane office tasks and maybe a, a higher level than the mundane tasks. So yeah. are you thinking that, that RPA will, in fact, uh, result in job losses? I Not not on average. Um, okay. What I'm seeing is most of the uptake in, in that I've seen so far with digital workers has been in, in uh, um, financial services, telco, manufacturing, and healthcare. Mm -hmm. And what it's... The problem with all four of those industries isn't that there's too many people. It's not like these are factories where they're replacing people with like robot, like physical machines that are assembling right. cars. Right. Their problem is they don't have enough people. So if you talk mm. to a bank, um, certainly retail banks, their problem isn't that they, that they got too many people and they want to replace them with, with robots to cut costs, is they've got too many people do, who have to do things that are hygiene for the bank. So they, they have people doing you know risk management, they're doing compliance. And these are all necessary. You cannot run a bank without that. Right. But that's basically sucking oxygen out of the bank away from revenue generating. So we had a bank in the UK actually who said that um, their, their, their automation strategy was very much, I want to take people out of compliance and automate it. And I want to put them on customer service because the problem hmm. we've got is there are, when you get edge cases in customer service, it's really labor intensive. Right. But the edge cases can actually be quite profitable. So you want to manage oh. them and you want to turn stuff around quick. We literally did not have the people to be able to do it. And so they were using automation to shift human capital away from non-revenue generating work. That oh. seems to generally be the case, the, 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 the on average. Now there are gonna be situations where people will use it to, to, uh, to replace people. But so far, I think it's more of a job creator at the moment because it's, it's, it, there's a compounding effect you get with automation. So go back to our retail bank. So what, they're, what they do is they say, okay, I'm going to shift people away from compliance and risk management because I've automated, I'm still doing it, obviously, um, but I'm going to automate, put those people into to revenue generating jobs. My revenue goes back, my revenue starts going up. So what do I do? I take my excess revenue, I put it back into automation, free more people up, put them onto revenue generating work. You okay. actually get a compounding effect and um, uh, that grows the bank. So, so it doesn't necessarily lead to job losses. And I think most of the time it doesn't. Most of the time this is about getting people more productive um, mm. because it's, it's, it is stunning how much work in this world. Office work is very manual. It is the equivalent right. of being on a assembly line pulling a thing, but, yep. but there is some decision component to it. So you're doing, I'll give you another thing that really surprised me was um, somebody's automated equity research. And oh, I thought, a really complex area. I thought, wait a minute, wait a minute. Yeah. I thought, How'd you do this? And they said, yeah. So they, so they got all these really expensive equity analysts took up 90% of their work. And I, and I thought, what? 
And this is what when we started analyzing what equity analysts were doing, and only about 10%, 50% of the time was actually thinking. Oh. They were going around pulling data off manual stuff, putting into reports, and a lot of this right. stuff is kind of almost routine and analytics. So I say, and, the, and, yeah. and uh, so they put robotics, and they said it's fantastic because now we now we're all these very expensive analysts are now spending their time analyzing, not uh -huh. constructing reports, tabling data, putting into spreadsheets. Yeah, you can automate all, all those processes. So right. trade reconciliation is another one. You know, I always thought that that would be automated. You know, not just by robots. I would just be there would be software systems that would just do it. Right. People don't, don't, you know, they're finding that RPA is a better way to do it. And at the end of the day, it's it's taking the horrible work. I mean, I've, I've had to do that in the past life. It's not fun. And, right. uh, and sure. uh, but it's it's very automatable, but it's different for every reason is every situation is different. Every, every bank is different. So there's chunks that can be automated that takes a lot of the sort of mind numbers out of it. And so what they're finding is, you know, the, the, these people who are doing the trade recognition are focusing on the real problems, not on the manual Okay, I gotta go check those three systems, check those three systems, see if it matches there, if it doesn't go there. You can get robots to do all that. And now what they're focused on is where, okay, what really went wrong? And you know, what do I gotta do to fix it? And um, so that seems to be the, the, the most common case. Um, but um, so I don't think it's doom and gloom. Yeah. Um, and we do, you know, when we go into companies, we do have to educate people on this. You know, we do get that concern from employees and it's fair enough. I mean, it's, you know, I, I right. you know it's not unreasonable when the robot right. people come in and you get a bit worried. <laughs> Um, but, um, but, but, you know, people realize very, very quickly that it really is a tool for the average worker, not a replacement for the average worker. So I, I want to make sure I might've derailed you a bit off the, off the future. We talked about it certainly, but do you have any, any last thought on say, where the future of RPA yeah. is going to, and, and perhaps how a company might prepare for it now? Yeah. Okay. So it's, I think it's, it's going to become a, um, a major component of digitization going forward. And I think Definitely, the future yeah. of digital of, of automation is digital workforces. So we're going to start, we're going to talk less about digital workers and robotics as a function. Mm -hmm. uh, it's going to be much more talked about as really a third part of your workforce. So, you, so right now you basically, you've got humans and you've got like the systems they operate on to conduct business and operations. Right. I think we'll, we're going to, well, we already, because we're, we're building it, is digital workers is that third force. And where RPA and robotics is going is it's not like you're going to have people over here, digital workers over there, and they kind of don't talk to each other. They're going to be fully integrated. And we talk about it as the unified uh, uh, workforce, where hmm. in effect, you're interacting with, with, with um, digital workers. You may not even know it. So, so the way we're designing the sort of management platform for this is that the, the, think of it as like a BPM platform for automation. Right. Is the platform just knows that there are people, there, there are some workers that just turn up nine to five and, and don't work for an hour at lunchtime. Right. And right. Um, there's other ones that just seem to work 24 seven, but that's fine. It knows from, from, you know, how people work, how to schedule work to them and how to move work through say a work queue. Mm -hmm. um, but it doesn't actually care, you know, uh, um, whether you're biological or, or silicon. The, um, and what's happening with, with, with you as a, as a human worker is, let's say you're, you're dealing with edge cases in, in, in mortgage applications, you're getting a message from somebody saying, can you check this please? I just wanna make sure that, you know, can we take this risk? Or how do I need to price this right to, to, to be able to take this risk? You'll respond and you won't realize that the person who messaged you was a robot. Um, <laughs> right, right. And that's already happening. And, and, yeah. and but that's, we wanna take that to the enterprise scale, which is, when you redesign your mortgage desk, that's what you're designing in. You're literally saying, okay, if it's all the, the sort of generic mortgage applications out there that are low risk, you know, we just, they get swept through by robots. The robots are then looking, ooh, this one looks a bit borderline. Right. It's going to go ask Joe over there what, what he thinks. He right. might ask Susan as well what she thinks. Susan mm -hmm. responds, doesn't realize that the person who asked Joe in the first place was a robot, doesn't matter. Right. Um, it's just an IM that's come through, you know, Teams or, or Slack, you know, it's, 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 it's just a message. Hmm. And that's the trick. And I think what, what will, the, the, the real future of it is not just this enterprise scale is that, you know, robotics is, is increasingly passing the Turing test. You know, people don't realize they're talking to them. Chatbots is a great example. The trick with chatbots is how do you triage between humans and a robot without someone knowing? So a really good chatbot flips you to a human and back and you don't oh. realize that it's wow. and it, and so it's that triage process is the key. Okay. Yeah. Um, if you get that to work quick, um, then you get a great customer experience because the robot's handling all, all the routine stuff. Right. The humans yeah. be able to dive in, solve problems that the robot can't, and the consumer is just getting a great experience, and they don't huh. realize that 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 it was two different types of entity that they were interacting with.
But that's is that happening, really? Is is, is that yeah. is that human human robot hybrid chatbot actually happening in the marketplace now? It's, absolutely, and that that's the um, when you're designing uh, uh, shop fronts with chatbots, a big part of your design is how do I do that triage? So how do I know that a robot can solve a problem, and that I can flip it to a human? And how can I get the flip back and forth to be smooth enough that you don't realize that's happening? Because because right. what you want at the end of the day is that customer that smooth customer experience. You want the robot to deal with the 80% of cases that it should be able to deal with. You want your humans in on the 20% that, that require a human being mm -hmm. and you want the customer to be happy. And, and it's that what you don't want is that the robot does something stupid right. or that it just stops. <laughs> you know what I mean? Or there's like, Indeed. Yeah. please wait a minute. And then I, I'm, fr I'm frozen. 20 minutes yeah. later, a human comes on the line. Says, what, what, can I help you, sir? You know? Right. And, right. And, yeah. So that's, that's, a, it's, it's actually part the core part of the design. And, mm -hmm. Our vision of, of human robotic cooperation is precisely that, in that it's not just the, the customer who's seen that smooth experience, the employee's seen that smooth experience. I mean, they're, you know, again, you know, and even whether they're aware of that, that the entity that they're interacting with the robot or not, it should be a positive experience. Right. So a big part of what we're doing as well is looking at, well, if I've got a robot that's working at the speed of light, you know, I can process a mortgage application in a second, whereas a human might take 10 minutes. Um, or 10 minutes to answer a question that the, 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 the digital workers know that, hey, I, I know I'm dealing with a human and I'm not going to bombard them with 30 cases in the next 10 seconds. Right. I know that I've got to give them a case, wait, and they'll come back to me. You know, so there's that intelligence to the, the, the digital worker knows it's dealing with a human and it knows that, okay, I got to pace my work in a way that, that, that the human can handle. Right. Um, because that, that it knows how to work with people. And it's a bit like teaching humans, you know, how do you work in a social environment? You learn those skills. Mm -hmm. And it's putting those kind of um, co cooperative skills into digital workers is, is, is important. And we do that through the management platform, actually. So it's uh -huh. the management platform is worrying about this. And that way you, you don't have to train each robot on it. You just got a, you know, a, basically a central brain that's kind of saying, you know, Mm -hmm. you're a robot i know that i know that your your rate of working is much higher than that thing over there so you know space it out a bit so it's, right. it's yeah fascinating fascinating eric i think you said it i think it's going to be there's no doubt about it rpa is going to really alter the workplace clearly it is uh so be curious to see how it goes hopefully we'll, we'll have you back on again in, in a while to see how it progresses uh, but I, I thank you very much for sharing your expertise today yeah no my pleasure enjoyed it it was a blast. All right. Thank you very much. Take care. Thank you. All right. Bye-bye.